I love singing about grace and uh, remember grace is God's influence on your heart and uh, it's an amazing, amazing thing. It really is that God would do that for us. Okay, let's take our Bibles go to 2 Corinthians chapter number uh, 10 and we are going to read verses 3 through 9. So let's all stand out of respect to God's word and uh, follow along with me as I read this. 2 Corinthians 10. 3 through 9. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord has given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. That I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. Father, please help us tonight to listen carefully to your word. Please give us some things uh, that will be a real encouragement to us and help and a help to us as we go about our daily life. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Last week, we, or a couple weeks ago, we started talking about um, this warfare, this war, for we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. <clears throat> and the word war means a f- uh, fighting to fight life's battles. It's talking about fighting life's battles. And God said, we are not, uh, we do not war after the flesh. Even though we have, live on this earth, uh, we don't fight our battles in the flesh. We go through things in our life, and we don't we don't fight those things in the flesh. Now, um, now again, we, we have to walk on this earth. But I read a verse to you uh, back in Philippians chapter three, verse twenty. Uh, I want to read it again to you, Philippians three twenty. For our conversation is in heaven, or our our citizenship that means is in heaven. That's where our home is. Amen. Boy, it'd be really good if we got a hold of that. Our home is in heaven. It wouldn't, if that was the case, it wouldn't seem like the, the things on this earth are so important. Now, they're, now they're, they are important. If, if life on earth was not important, God would not leave us here. Um, but So it is, there are important things on this earth, but we need to understand that our citizenship is in heaven. That's where we're going to live. We're going to live with God, in, and eventually we're going to live in the new Jerusalem, but that's where it is. And so we need to be, const- and so since our citizenship is in heaven, we ought to be living a lifestyle like that, and that includes when we fight a war, when we fight our war. We ought to fight it God's way. We ought not to fight it in the flesh. You're going to fight the battles of life. You don't fight uh, the war earth's way. You fight the war heaven's way, and that is so important. Uh, a lot of Christians are fighting the battles of life earth's way, and just want, I want to tell you, when you fight the battles of life earth's way, you're going to lose. Right. Okay, you're going to lose. What does that mean? That means your situation, the battles that you're in, your life's going to wind up getting worse. It's not going to get better. If you fight it God's way, you're guaranteed the victory. So, I mean, I'd rather do it the way I'm going to win than do it in a way I'm going to lose if I have to fight war. Now, in verse 4, it says here, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, All right? Warfare means battle against the flesh. Weapons, the word weapons there in verse 4 means tools, Okay, so the tools that we have uh, are not um, are not carnal weapons of our warfare. The, we- the the tools that we use to fight the battles against the flesh are not carnal. Our word carnal there means fleshly, but mighty through God. Mighty means powerful or capable. Mighty or powerful through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Pulling down means to demolish. Okay. So, the God's talking about, I'm going to pull down strongholds. I'm going to demolish these strongholds, right? Now, <clears throat> the word stronghold there in verse number four means arguments or human reasoning, right? So, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but th- mighty through God to the pulling down or demolishing of arguments or human reasoning. <clears throat> so, that's what God wants, wants to, us to do. He, want, he wants us to get rid of the strongholds. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a second here. Then he says in verse 5, casting down or demolishing imaginations. 
Now, imaginations there in verse number five means made up conclusions or made up reasoning. All right, made up conclusions or made up reasoning. Casting out or demolishing these made up conclusions or made up reasonings and every high thing or every elevated place that exalteth or raiseth up itself against the knowledge of God or opposing the knowledge of God. And the knowledge of God would be referring to God's word. Okay, and bringing into captivity as a prisoner every thought to the obedience of Christ. All right, God's word will demolish Satan's imaginary ideas. So we need to make ourselves think God's way. Now, this tells me that the battle that it's talking about, the warfare it's talking about, the battle mainly is in the mind. Okay, that's where the battle mainly is. The, the The battleground is your mind. It's the way you think. All right, if you can get victory in that area of your life, you're going to win the victory victories uh, from the battles you face in life. You're going to win more battles than you're going to lose, and you're going to win the war. Now, how do I know I won the war? All right, again, I, I, this scripture is, is we use it a lot, but you got to get a hold of this. This means that you won the war, okay, because I consider Paul the Apostle an example of someone who fought the war, the warfare that he's talking about, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and he won. All right, and here's how I know he won. Verse 6 of 2 Timothy 4, 6, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. It's time for me to die, but not only is it time for me to die, but I'm ready to die. I am ready to die. All right? You know, some people, some people say, well, I'm ready to leave this world. You say you're ready. Some people say that, and what they mean is, I'm sick and tired of this life. I want to get out of here. But the truth of the matter is, you're not ready to leave. Because your life's not in order. You've been fighting the battles of life, but you've been losing. Because you're fighting them in the flesh. So you really, you're not ready to go. You may think you are just to get away from the burdens of this life. <clears throat> but you're not. But Paul said, I am ready to be offered. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. That's a person who is ready to go. That's a person who has won the victory. That's a person who has won the battles of life. He's the war. He's, he's won the war. He is ready to be offered. He's fought a good fight. He's finished his course. I'm done. Okay. Now, how many of us are going to leave this earth having finished our course? See, I mean, we may leave this. We're going to leave this earth when it's time for us to leave this earth. But have we finished our course? Have we finished the race? Paul did. He won the war. And that's what we want to do. And he got, he got the victory. And Paul talked a lot about the mind. He did. He talked a lot about the mind in his writings. Uh, and so uh, he, knew, he knew what the war was all about. Uh, in verse 6 it says, And having in, obe- in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, this verse is talking about how we need to be prepared to fight back against anti-Bible philosophies that we or others have have uh, <clears throat> got a hold of, all right? We have got a hold of. We've got to be ready to fight or revenge or retaliate against all of these anti-Bible philosophies which cause us to live a life of disobedience. We need to fight against that. Now, we're going to talk more about that as we go along here. Now, I want to go back up to verses 3 and 4. Uh, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but uh, mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, I want to talk about that strong the strongholds. These are the arguments. These are the, the things that come into our mind that fight against us as we try to go forward in the Christian life. Let me give you some. Uh, let me give you some examples. Um, uh, about about this, all right? <clears throat> we reason these things out in our fleshly mind, and they can become strongholds. Uh, for instance, um, <clears throat> we, we people it, actually people fight about this. Now, I mean, are, they really this is a stronghold. Uh, why I cannot have daily Bible time? It's a stronghold. It really is. I mean, they they reason it out in their mind. They they say they're too busy. Um, 
Uh, they say that they they just can't. They're not they're not an early riser. You see, um, they say, well, I'll, I, I'm I'm going to try to read it every day, uh, but and then some. But they don't make a set time for it uh, because they they say, well, I just I'm just not a scheduled person. It's all these excuses, and and they really believe them. They're strongholds. They hold on to them. They hold on to these people strong. And so uh, they, they seem like good reasons to them. And it stops them from doing the main thing a Christian should be doing every day, and that's reading the Bible. Right. Uh, people will say this, I, I can't pray. Uh, they'll, say, they'll say, I don't have any time to pray. I fall asleep when I pray. Uh, I, pr- I, I pray, God doesn't answer me. Well, first of all, uh, you know, all these things, I mean, you know, Okay, I don't pray because God answers my prayers. I pray because God tells me to pray. That's why I pray. Amen. Whether he answers me or not, that's up to him. But I pray because I'm supposed to pray. By the way, that'll keep me praying even when I don't get any answers. Right? <clears throat> didn't, didn't Samuel say, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you? By stopping? Didn't Paul write, I'll pray without ceasing? Men are always to pray, Jesus said, and not to faint. But yet Christians have this, this they, they, I really struggle with my prayer life. And, and, and they, they struggle so much. What they're really saying is, I hardly ever pray. A lot of times they're saying that. I hardly ever pray. Now, they may be struggling in the area that they're struggling to get answers. Uh, but, they, but somehow, some way, there's some kind of stronghold in their mind about prayer. So they don't have this, this effective prayer life, uh, this regular prayer life where they meet God and they talk, they, they ask God for things on a daily basis, like we're supposed to do. Uh, they give up praying about something when, when uh, there's no reason why they should give up. The reason is they don't see the answer. Well, that doesn't mean you give up. Right. See? Uh, for, they say, uh, people say this, I can't overcome my bad character. I've tried, but I just can't do it. All right? <clears throat> And they really believe this. They get this this thing in their mind. I mean, you wouldn't believe how, I mean, how many people I've dealt with in the years, uh, in these all these years that just had they, their their main problem was they didn't have much character, and yet they just would not. For some reason they didn't think they could do it. Now I, I you know, I, we I preached about this before that the simplicity of the Christian life and the Christian life is is God lays it out pretty simple, but yet we complicate it. And we throw all these excuses on why we can't do it. we got these strongholds in our mind. Um, now, I, I've tried to do it. Well, one of the reasons why you're having a problem, do, uh, you've tried and not done it, is because uh, you don't do it through Christ. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Amen. That's what the Bible says. So who am I supposed to believe? When you tell me, I just, I just have this bad character and I can't overcome it. Who am I supposed to believe? You or God? God says you can. What really it comes down to is this, where the stronghold is, you're not thinking right. What you need to start thinking is, the, my problem is, I just won't overcome it. I just don't want to. That's the real problem. See, you, you can do it. You can do it. You know what? Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. So if your old creature had no character, your new one's going to have character. That's right. God, when God starts building a person's life, Believe me, character is a big part of it. <clears throat> That's doing right. Just an automatic doing of right. And even doing right when no one is looking except God. By the way, God's always looking. Did you know that? God's always looking. Don't forget about that. God's always looking. When you get this idea, I can get away with this? No, you can't. No, you can't. You can't. You, can. you may get away with it for the moment, but you're not going to get away with it. You didn't get away with it. God saw you. Right. See, don't forget about that. Right? Uh, some people will say, have a stronghold when it comes to finances. I I can't tithe, uh, and they say, "Well, I can't tithe because I'm in debt and I can't afford to tithe." Or I just like to buy things, and, and they just can't control their spending. They have this stronghold. This thing just grips them. You see. Uh, some people have it in the area, young people have it in the area of getting married. Why, I, I, I can, why should I marry this person? Because I can change them. I know they're not saved, or I know they're not a committed Christian, 
But, you know, we just love each other. Just The stronghold comes into your mind. It's, it's against the, what God says in the Bible, but you, you believe it, you grab onto it, and you believe that over what God says. And it becomes a stronghold. Some people will think, uh, why, why I can't be a soul winner? I just, I just can't, not good at talking to people. What has that got to do with it? I could never see myself knocking on a strange door. Well, you know what? God can see it. God can see you doing it. Yeah, see? But yet we come up with excuses on why we can't do it. There's one reason or another. You know, by the way, can I just tell you all these strongholds, uh, when you try to, if you keep a hold of them and you don't break them, and the Bible says here you can, God said, uh, but mighty through God to the pulling down or the demolishing of these strongholds. But if you don't break them before you get to heaven uh, and you try to use them at the judgment seat of Christ, they're not going to hold any water at all. So you might as well get rid of them now so you don't have them when you go to heaven. You, you don't want these things. But I just, I, just can't, I just can't witness. I just can't be a soul winner. I just, that's just not me. You know, one person said to me one time, soul winning is just not my bag. Well, it's God's. I, said, I looked at him, I said, well, it's God's bag. And if it's God's, it ought to be yours if you're his child. Right. See? Some people say, uh, have this stronghold about, they think about why it's okay to miss church. Work, I don't feel good, whatever. Uh, they have this stronghold thinking that it's okay to do that. It's, it's all right. You know, it's a stronghold. It's a stronghold in our life. And, and the Bible says that these can be pulled down. Remember what the phrase pulled down there means in verse uh, verse 4, it means to be to demolish them like they weren't even there. Wow, that's deliverance. Freedom from these strongholds. And so God wants to do that in our life. He wants to get rid of these strongholds. He wants to wipe them out. Now, <clears throat> um, so in these verses here, it talks about this war that we're in. And the first thing, so in order to to wipe out these strongholds in order to get this victory that God promises that we, we can have, uh, we definitely need uh, to recognize the fact that we are in a war, all right? We've got to recognize the fact that we are in a war, and we, we cannot uh, <clears throat> get, get away from that. We cannot go, okay, uh, we cannot just walk around like everything's wonderful, everything's great. Uh, we wake up each day, and we just kind of go through life, and hopefully we'll have a good day, and and hopefully nothing will go wrong. You know, all the, all the stuff, that the irritating things, the frustrating things, the temptations you face, it's all part of this warfare that you're in. You're in a war. You're in a battle. Satan wants to, wants to have you, and he's fighting for you. Do you understand that? He's fighting for control of your life. It's a desperate fight for him. He wants you very, very much. He really does. And he's not going to let up until you take your last breath. And if you decide to surrender to him and just let him have his way, uh, by the way, if you do that, he will walk guard around you until you go to heaven, which will be a lot. If you stay surrendered to him, uh, going to he you're going to heaven will be a lot earlier than it's supposed to be. I promise you that. But he's going to make sure if he's got you, he's, he's going to work hard. He works hard to get you. And when he gets you, he's going to work hard to keep you. All right, so you're in a war. It's a war. It's an all-out war. It's God against the devil, and Satan, of course, he lost. He lost the, the the fight for your soul. But if you got saved, but if but he's he's not gonna he's gonna keep fighting for your life. Boy, you know, God he uses unsaved people a lot. He really does. I mean, he uses unsaved people a lot uh, to fight to to do his work. But you know what the most effective people doing his work are? Backslidden Christians. They are the most effective at doing Satan's work. That's why he wants us. That's why he wants us, right? <clears throat> um, I, I know I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a world-famous Christian or anything like that. I never will be. But I'll tell you what, if, if he gets me to serve him, it's, I know it's going to affect more than me. I know that. And, and so he's, he's working out real hard. It's going to be a ripple effect if he gets me. I've talked to a lot of people about the Lord. I, I, have, I have made it real clear and strong where I stand 
uh, as far as it being a Christian goes, with my family, uh, with with, uh, with my neighbors, with people people that I've 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 been I've known all these years. And for, if I go back from God, if He gets a hold of my life, if Satan wins, it's gonna it's gonna be a uh, it's gonna be a problem. So I got to recognize the fact that I am in a war, and this isn't this isn't uh, we're not playing games here. This isn't no this isn't a practice thing. But there's no practicing. It's it, the moment you got saved, boy, you're in a war right then and there. There's no boot camp or anything. You're just right there. You're in a war, and he's fighting for you. Now we got to recognize that we are in a war. Once you do that, then you have to decide you're going to fight it. God's way. As he said here in verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. You got to make up your mind that I'm in a war and I'm going to I'm going to fight it God's way. I'm not going to fight it the world's way. Amen. Now, I you would probably you would probably go a long way to, before you met somebody who did not admit unsaved or saved that life was a struggle. I think everybody would admit that. The adults especially, they would admit that life is a struggle. Unsaved, saved the like would say that. All right? <clears throat> and so, um, but and the saved people would say that too. So if we're if we're going to be in a struggle, which is actually, for the Christian, it's, a, it's an all-out war. Uh, and by the way, uh, go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse uh, number uh, 12. Okay? Now, this is what you got to see. <clears throat> He said here, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Flesh, what's flesh and blood? Human beings, right? That's human beings. So we're not wrestling, we're not fighting, we're not struggling with human beings. We're fighting with spiritual beings here. Not human beings, but spiritual beings. That's what the battle's against. And who are the spiritual beings? Well, if you read the Bible, the spiritual beings are Satan and his demons. All right, so that's who we're wrestling against. That's who we're fighting against. We got to we got to understand that. We got to see that. All right now, he says, Paul said, we do not war after the flesh. Now, if you try to fight the spiritual war warfare in the flesh, you are guaranteed to lose. Now, I want you to think about this. What does it mean if you lose? To you personally, what does it mean? Now, what it means to me and what it means to you will be two, could be two different things, probably will be two different things, because we have different lives. But what does it mean if you lose? All right? Think about that. Uh, and so it's, it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be something that you're going to be excited about. It's going to be something you're going to regret if you allow Satan to beat you. And by the way, you have a guarantee in this book of winning the victory. There's absolutely no reason for you to lose this war. Absolutely none. But you think about this. If you fight the war in the flesh, if you use worldly means to fight against the devil and, and his battle against you, you are going to lose. And consider strongly uh, what that means. How messed up will your life be? Now, it's going to be messed up. But how messed up? What will that, what will that all involve? What will be the details? Uh, you don't know that. You just know it's going to be bad. But you don't know how bad. See, and it's really sad because, you know, if you're saved, you're going to sit there in the in, in the ash heap of your life because you fought, you tried to fight the battles of life in the flesh and you lost. You're going to sit in the ash heap of your life and you're going to feel just, you're just going to feel even worse when you realize you didn't have to lose. God was right there to win the battle for you. He gives that example uh, many times in the Bible. He took, for instance, he tells his people when they're in a war, he says, uh, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord. He tells the people in, when they're in a battle, the battle's not yours, it's God's, it's mine. So you don't have to lose it. And you're going to feel terrible when you, if you lose. You're going to feel awful realizing you didn't have to be like this. You didn't have to wind up like this. 
I think about my sister, and it's not easy to talk about this, but I know if she, I know right now if if she if she can hear it up in heaven, she's saying, "Tell it, Michael. Tell it." She lost. She lost the war. She was in a battle. She was in a struggle in her life before she got saved, and then she got saved. I mean, she got she got saved. You know, how you you know, there's getting saved and there's really getting saved. It's just like dying and then being really dead. <clears throat> you know, uh, but no, she was she got saved. She got saved, and her life began to change. And I told you about her. But when we got the phone call in October of 2005, I think it was that they found her dead in a trailer all by herself out on the East Coast. Now, that's from, from, uh, from Missouri, from O'Fallon, Missouri. It's probably maybe, a, I guess, a thousand miles, something like that, maybe. From where she was, from her church, from her church family, they found her dead by herself in a trailer, and Satan won. Now, he didn't take her to hell. She's in heaven. She's saved. Once you're saved, you're always saved. That's what the Bible says. And I'm thankful for that. But Satan won in the battle for her life. Now, he didn't beat God. He beat her. Because she told God, God, you stay out of it. I'll fight this by myself. And she started fighting the, the war. She, she was, when she was fighting the war uh, of life, the struggle of life with the weapons that God gave her, she was winning. It was really clear she was winning. I mean, she was a different person. But when she pushed God aside, like we said Sunday, told God to get off the throne, I'll take over. And she still had the struggle, so she was battling the, the, the struggles of life in the flesh. Well, she lost. You see. So, <clears throat> that's what's going to happen if you fight it in the flesh. He says, we do not war after the flesh. Why, why, why did Paul war after the flesh? He had enough weapons uh, for, in the flesh. I mean, he was a smart guy. Well, he says, I'm not going to fight in the flesh. This, we're this, this, I'll lose if I do that. Then he said, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So he fought it, he fought it God's way. He fought it God's way, not the world's way. And God gave us weapons. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. What are they? If they're not, if they're not carnal, they're spiritual. God gave us spiritual weapons. And God says they're mighty through God. They're mighty. They are powerful. They are capable of doing what? Of pulling down the strongholds. Of demolishing the, th the arguments and the human reasonings in our mind. Remember, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And th the weapons that God gives us will pull down these, this terrible thinking, this this worldly thinking. And we'll start thinking the right way and we'll win. Now, God said these weapons are powerful and capable. God says they will demolish the arguments in our mind that we make up on why we can't do right or why it's okay that we're doing wrong. You see, God give us, he gave us weapons to do that. And he says, if you use these weapons... They will pull down the strongholds in your mind. Verse 5, casting down imaginations. Casting down imaginations. All right? <clears throat> that means demolishing made-up conclusions or made-up reasonings and also casting down or demolishing every high thing, elevated place that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing it into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, we do this by filling our mind <clears throat> with how God thinks. That's what we got to do. We got to fill our mind with how God thinks. Now, as you sit here tonight, are you willing to do that? Are you willing, do you recognize the fact that you are in a war? You are in a warfare. This is a desperate Desperate, desperate fight. <clears throat> Boy. 
What would happen if he gets you? What would happen if Satan gets you? I don't know. I mean, I know one thing. If he got me, I would never open my, my mouth again for the Lord. I would never witness to anybody. Or if I did, I'd be like Lot. I would seem as one that mocks, oh, you're just making fun of it now. That's how, you know, right? Here's how, this is what it would see. This is what it would be like. Okay, here I am. I'm living for God. I'm, I'm trying to do right. So I'm out soul winning. And I sit down in my New Testament. And I'm telling somebody how to get saved. I'm saying, man, the Bible says here you're a sinner. And the Bible says, and I'm just into it. And I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about it. And a lot of times I'll just start crying when I'm talking to him. That's the way I look right now. But if I walked away from God and I started talking about the Lord, I'd say, I'd sound like this. You need to get saved so you don't go to hell. You don't want to burn in hell, do you? There's one that mocks. That's what I would sound like. See, <clears throat> what a difference. What a difference. One, one person is saying, you got to get saved. You just got to get saved. The other person is saying, don't do anything dumb like getting saved. I tried that stuff. What a difference. See, I mean, I could wind up being the obstacle to one of my grandkids getting saved. I've got two that are. I've got three that aren't old enough yet. And there's probably more on the way. And I could, be, I could be used by Satan as a major obstacle to one of them getting saved. Where right now, I am a tool of the Lord to encourage them along that line. I mean, there'll be, there, any, any, when, I've heard, when I heard Jenna got saved, I heard Kalen got saved, I was so excited about that. I saw him get baptized. That was a thrill for me to see that. But it could be somewhere down the road I'll be an obstacle that help that tries to stop it. I may even try to talk them out of it. That's what Satan can do to me. If he gets a stronghold built in my mind and feeds and I feed that with carnal a carnal way, it's going to make it worse. <coughs> See how important this warfare is? I don't think we get I think we just kind of go through life sometimes and pretend like that's not happening. But it is. We're in a war. You see, <clears throat> now, we, we com combat this, str these strongholds. We tear down these strongholds. We demolish these strongholds that are in our mind that's, that, that cause us to, loot, to struggle with sin and thinking that it's okay to sin or we can get away with it this one time or all the kind of junk, that, all the kind of imaginary things that, that Satan puts in our mind and gets us to think that it's real. That it's right thinking. We get we fight all this. We demolish all these things by filling our mind with how God thinks. Amen. Because if we start thinking like God thinks, we're going to start doing what God does. That's how it works. <clears throat> we are prepared to fight back against this wrong kind of living that we've done. All right, we're prepared to fight back. Now, <clears throat> um, in verse 6, he talks here about, uh, he, he talks about, the, he has the word disobedience and the word obedience. Now, <clears throat> when we are thinking wrong, we are living, when, when, when we're filled with strongholds, when strongholds got a hold of us, for instance, um, there are people that have strongholds against another person. They, they hold this grudge against this person, and they, th they justify it somehow. They act like they don't have to forgive this person. It's okay to, 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 uh, to feel this way about this person and be angry and to, and to have this stronghold. <clears throat> and that's against the Bible. And so, we, so, so I, I hold this bitterness against this person. I, I won't forgive this person. What am I doing? I'm living a life of disobedience. Because right. God said I'm supposed to forgive. So when I get rid of these strongholds, it now results in a life of obedience. And I can fight back to undo all the, the damage I did by living a life of disobedience. 
Now, I want, I want to give some, uh, I want to talk to, I want to talk a little bit right now about, about disobedience. I want you to see this. Diso- disobedience is simply, um, not doing what God said to do or doing what God said not to do. God said, God said, just like a parent, you tell a child to do something, they don't do it. That's disobedience. Right. You tell them to do something, they don't do it. You tell them not to do something and they do it anyway, that's disobedience. All right, you can call it rebellion, you can call it sin, but it's disobedience. Now, I want you to look at some scripture. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 28. We got to get a hold of this thing because we're in a war. And if you don't see the, if you're, if you are not battling this God's way, you're going to lose this war and you're going to be living a life of disobedience, which we're going to read about right now. And you can see as we look at these verses, how that's going to take you down a road of Satan destroying your life. Which means destroying your family, which means destroying your testimony, destroying your future. Wow, that's bad. Deuteronomy 11, 28, And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. I want, I want to read these verses because I want you to see how serious God is about this idea of disobeying him. All right. You know, just like what we tried to do when we were raising our kids. I, my wife used this a lot about trying to make sin exceeding sinful. When our child disobeyed, it wasn't like, uh, well, they're only two years old. Uh-uh. When they disobeyed, it was like the end of the world just came. Well, I remember one time, one of our girls looked at, at, my, at my, I won't tell you which one, but looked at my wife and said how, something like, how dare you, to my wife. The little girl thought the end of the world came. <laughs> and she was wishing the end of the world would come. I mean, it was like you just, oh, it's like you just assassinated the president. <laughs> It was awful. It was terrible. We made it a big deal. And you know what? Christians have, I've seen Christian parents do this. Like, I have sat there and watched Christian parents. I watched the kids totally go against what mom said, and the parent just ignores it. Or says, Now I I told you not to do that. And just la di da, the kid goes on the way, on her way, or his way, like, no big deal. If you don't make this a big deal to your children, children disobeying, they won't think it's a big deal to disobey God. And it is a big deal to disobey God. That's why we're going to read these verses, because I want you to see it. What God says about disobeying. And the reason why he says these things about disobeying, it's all part of this warfare. And if you, it's all part of, 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 of what, what Satan is fighting for and trying to get you to do. And you got to see how serious it is. Deuteronomy eleven twenty eight. And a curse, if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after gods which you have not known. God said a curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. A curse. Wow. That's amazing to me. Now, let me tell you something. When I read the Bible, I see the love of God all throughout the Bible. There's not a doubt in my mind that God is the most loving person in the universe. No doubt about it. And so when I read verses like this, wow, a curse. On those that disobey. That must be pretty serious to disobey God for God to say, you're cursed if you do that. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, 15. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna spend, I mean I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time more time tonight, but I'm gonna spend for a while on these these verses here talking about this stuff because I want you to get a hold of this warfare. Deuteronomy 28, 15, and it shall come to pass. If thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do most of his commandments and his statutes, I command thee this day. Okay? It doesn't say that, does it? 
It might say that in the NIV, but it doesn't say it in my Bible. It doesn't say it in the King James. The perfect, preserved word of God. It shall come to pass, thou not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes I command this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Now, this is what the average Christian thinks. The average Christian thinks that God just gives, this is a stronghold. God just gives us a list of these things that we're supposed to do, and he says to us, you pick out some and do them. The rest of them, don't worry about, it's okay, me. Whatever you decide to pick out and try to do, I'll work with you on that. And whatever you decide to leave there and don't do, I'll turn my head away from it. And we'll act like it wasn't even on the list, okay? I'm telling you, that's the average way a Christian thinks today. It's kind of like when we were raising our kids. And we made a list of things. This is, this is a list of the do's and don'ts of the Richter household. And we have scripture after all, after all the, uh, the ones. And we said, okay, now, we sat down. The kids said, this is, we didn't say to them, now you, there's ten things on this list. You pick out five you want to do, and we'll just cross out the list of the five. Which means if I tell you to do something on those five you didn't choose, you don't have to do it. You think I said that? No. I, I, let's say there was ten on the list. How many were they supposed to do? All ten. God said to observe do all my commandments. That's what he said. Now, praise the Lord we have a God who understands that we're sinners and we're going to mess up. Praise the Lord that we have a God who gives us time to grow. Okay, he doesn't expect perfection right away. He just expects us to point in the right direction, head down that direction. And everything we learn along the way, he expects us to obey it, to do it. See? Um, let's go to another one here. Deuteronomy chapter 28. I don't want to go to that one. Uh, I'm going to go to the next one here. Let me get over here to where I have it written down. Uh, go to um, 1 Samuel 12, 15. Now, just, I want you to see this. 1 Samuel 12, 15, But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. The hand of the Lord will be against you. Now, again, this isn't taught, listen to me, I'm not talking about people who are surrendered to God, they're trying to live right, they're trying to do the best they can. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the person that, that just kind of has the attitude of, well, you know, I, I know God wants me to obey, so I'll, I'll, I'll obey some things, and when I don't want to obey, I won't. And me and God, we're still like this. The person who kind of just kind of takes it lackadaisical in their Christian life, doesn't really care, not really serious, not really zealous, not really urgent about, about living for the Lord and doing God's will for their life. He says, if you not, do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord. Rebel means, I am not going to do it. I know I'm supposed to. I'm not. Then shall the hand of the Lord be against you. Now, that's, that's a phrase. The hand of the Lord shall be against you. <clears throat> what, again, I, what I do is I step back, I look at that phrase, and I, I meditate on it. I think about it. I say, what does that mean to me? If God's hand is against me, what does that mean? If God's hand is for me, the Bible says if God's hand is for me, that means he's blessing what I'm doing. He's helping me do things. He's guiding, directing my path. See, he's working with me. He's working for me sometimes, helping me. But if his hand is against me, it's the exact opposite of that. When I was in Bible college, God's hand was with me. God's hand was helping me. Uh, he helped me when I when I I, I know I, I know this for a fact. I mean, there's no way I could have got uh, good grades on my tests if God's hand was not working with me. Because you, I'm telling you, Bible college schedule, you get three to four hours sleep a night, and it's, and the rest of the time you're up, you're studying, you're you're working in a ministry, you're working a job, you're trying to spend time with your good quality time with your family. So you're absolutely, totally 
bush, worn out, tired, all that. And to sit, go to sit into uh, go to a classroom and sit and take a test, your mind's got to be clear. And I was able to do that. Well, I, that's God's hand working for me, working with me, helping me. If His hand was against me, that never would have happened. He'd been working to, to, uh, working with me or working against me to get me to not pass my tests. And that, you apply that to any, any area of your life. And so we, God offers to work with us, but he says, if you rebel against me, disobey my commandments, then I'm going to work against you. Go to 1 Samuel 28, 18. And I'm going to just read a couple more here. 1 Samuel 28, 18. I want you to really grab a hold of this and, and really get the importance of, how, of the a matter of obedience. 1 Samuel 28, 18. Because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executed his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. Now, the, he, he executed judgment against them. Why? Simple reason they didn't obey. They didn't obey. Okay. But let's just th- talk about something practical. So let's say this Sunday comes. And, you know, the Bible, and I don't talk a whole lot about this, so I don't feel bad talking about it now. Um, but the Bible makes it clear that we're supposed to tithe. Right. We're supposed to give 10% of our income. If I make $500 a week, I'm supposed to tithe 50 of that and give an offering, which means I give over $50. Very simple. Tithe and offering, Malachi chapter 3, it's in the Bible. Okay? <clears throat> I don't care if it's Old Testament. Old Testament is still in the Bible last time I looked. So, so I, 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 I'm supposed to do that. So if I, made five, if I got a $500 paycheck last week, uh, Sunday morning comes, I better drop in an off, a tithe and an offering of at least $51. At least. I can get more if I want. If I don't do it, that's disobedience. See? Now, if I disobey God, knowing I'm supposed to do that, if I disobey God, that's rebellion, and God is now going to work against me. What could that mean? Well, I, I may lose my job. My car may break down. You see? Something like that might happen. Why? God's working against me. Hey, can God break down my car? <laughs> yep. You t- let me tell you something. You take all the mechanics in our church and put them all together that know anything about cars. He knows a million times more than all of you put together about cars. All he has to do is think it. Imagine that having that power break down. <laughs> wow, that's power. But he can do that. See, now if he's working for me, uh, he can turn. He, he can make my so my finances are blessed. And a lot of people give testimony. I've heard it over and over again of people who started tithing, who got blessed by God amazingly. Just like he said, I'll, I'll open up the windows of heaven. Amen. That's God working for you. You see, so I'm just telling you, this idea of obedience and disobedience, it, this is a huge, huge thing to God. So tonight, I want you to think about that, okay? Do you recognize that you are in a war? Your mind is the main battleground. Are you fighting it God's way? Are you using his weapons? And we'll talk more about his weapons as we go along here in the future. All right. By the way, his main weapon is the Bible, just so you know. And that's what will change your thinking the right way. And then when it comes to the obedience, can you think of anything in your life right now, any kind of area of your life where you're being disobedient to God? Remember, it's kind of like parents. They have rule, uh, parents have rules in their house. They go over the rules with the kids. They expect every rule to be followed. They don't expect the kid to be perfect at it because the child is not perfect. No one's perfect. But they do expect the child to make every effort to obey all of those rules. And the rules are explained to them. What they mean, what, what the reason for them, and the punishment if you don't do it. And that's what God does in the Bible. And, and if he does it. He gives us time. He's merciful. He's gracious. But is there anything in your life right now that you are intentionally 
disobeying God in. Think about that. And if you are, just in the few verses we read tonight, do you see the seriousness of it? That you need to get that right tonight. Praise the Lord. You can come, you can kneel where you're at. You can come to an altar. You can kneel. You can ask God to forgive you, and he'll forgive you just like that. And you can walk out of here not disobedient in that area of your life, but now you're obedient. You see, you can do that. It's really important if you're going to win the war. If you're going to win this battle that you're in against Satan as he tries to destroy your life and turn everything around so you're now living against God and get God's hand against you instead of blessing you like he wants to. It's really important that you fight the, fight the war God's way. Maybe you're here tonight, you're, you know you're battling, you know life's a struggle, but you're fighting, you're using carnal weapons, you're using, you're using the reasoning in your mind, maybe you're using some methods that the world's giving you to help combat things. You don't, you don't fight depression with, with the world's way of doing it, you fight it God's way. You don't fight anger with the way the world tells you to fight anger, you fight it God's way. You don't fight, fight marital problems uh, the way the world says to do it. You do it God's way. Will you decide to drop the carnal weapons and pick up the spiritual weapons that God's given you? Guaranteed victory if you do. And I know that's what you want. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the Bible. Help us take what we learned tonight and apply it to our life. Lord, there's so much. I got so much here to say, so much to teach, and there's just not enough time to do it. But I pray, Lord, you'd help us to apply these things to our life to recognize that we are in a war. We are definitely in a war, and the war involves our mind, and in our mind we have strongholds. We have strongholds, reasonings, <clears throat> things that we reason out with our fleshly mind, and God wants to use his weapons to wipe all that out. Lord, help us to, to be willing to recognize this warfare, to decide to fight it God's way, not the world's way, to use God's weapons, to fill our mind with how God thinks, and to search our hearts for any kind of disobedience, any kind of rebellion, and decide to fight that with obedience. Finding out what God wants us to do, how God thinks about it, and decide to do it things God's way. Help us to do that tonight. Have your way in this invitation. Our heads bowed, eyes are closed. Now, you know what the Holy Spirit said to you tonight. The altar's open for you to use it. But I'll tell you one thing. If you're if you're tonight, you don't know for sure you're going to heaven. The most important thing is that you... you you come and get his salvation. The Bible says you're a sinner and you deserve to go to hell to pay for your sins. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says that Jesus Christ loved you so much, he came to earth and died for your sins for you so you wouldn't have to go to hell yourself and die for him. The, the Bible says he bought you the gift of eternal life. He paid for that gift with his own life. That was the price he paid. And the Bible says that he rose from the dead three days later. And so if you call on him and ask him to save you from hell and give you eternal life, the Bible says you'll be saved. If you're saved from hell, that means you're going to heaven when you die. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's God's promise. If you've never called on Jesus and asked him to save you, you can do it tonight. We're going to have a song of invitation. When the song begins, if you leave your seat, walk up to me and say, Pastor, I'd like to see from the Bible how to be saved, how I can have eternal life. We'll have somebody take the Bible and show you that privately. It won't embarrass you at all. If, if, you, if you aren't saved, if you are saved, and maybe you need to get baptized, come up and tell me you'd like to do that. We'll be glad to help you do that. But maybe God spoke to you from the Bible study about your life and about this spiritual war that you're in. And you want to talk to the Lord about it at this altar. Feel free to come up here and use it.